printer in the lobby. And so just go right there after the service and ask for one, and we will gladly send you home with your own copy of the Bible today. But this morning, we're going to continue our line-by-line, paragraph-by-paragraph study through the whole book of Exodus. And we'll be focusing here on verses 11 through 22 this morning. And so one more time, get that open, and I'll join you there in just a minute. Um, A.W. Tozer is a name that you really should know about, church. How many of you know who A.W. Tozer is? Okay, so I'm encouraged by that. A lot of you already know. He, he was a Christian Missionary Alliance pastor who served in the city of Chicago for a number of years. Uh, maybe uh, you're familiar with some of his books or his other writings. He wrote many fabulous books, several of which became very famous, like The Pursuit of God, uh, The Knowledge of the Holy, The Crucified Life. And he's just one of those authors that has uh, just a unique ability to say something super powerful in a very concise and memorable way. For example, here's just a sampling of some of his most well-known quotes. He said, Satan's greatest weapon is man's ignorance of God's word. Isn't that good? Or or this one, a frightened world needs a fearless church. You believe that? What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us, says A.W. Tozer. He was just a, a truly gifted student and teacher of the scriptures, and This morning, I want you to especially think about this next quote from his book, The Root of the Righteous, where I I think he just nails it. He says this, quote, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Just stop and think about that for a minute. It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. What is Tozer saying there? He's saying this, that in order for God to entrust uh, you and me with great ministry opportunity, in order for God to work in and through us in powerful ways, he has to first take us through difficult seasons of trial and challenge. He has to take us through seasons of hardship where we come to realize that it really is true when the Bible, what the Bible says that without God, we really can do nothing. It's not like we can sort of get by and and do okay without God, but but he kind of comes along and helps us out with what we can't do. No, we can't do anything, right? We we have to get to that place where we realize that there's, there's a model of preparation for God's will to be fully manifested in our lives that is going to require the deconstruction of who we think we are. Jesus talked about this in John chapter 12. 24 through 26, this is what Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, listen, he must follow me, says Jesus. What's he talking about? He's saying the same thing that Tozer said. And it's the same thing that Jesus would then say in turn to the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And that's why then, since God's power is made perfect in our weaknesses, that God's plan typically involves the intentional disassembly of his servants through painful providence, so that he can prove himself mighty and rebuild them for his own Glory, which also means that when it comes to serving the purposes of God and his kingdom mission, that the people that he uses greatly must first be broken before they will ever be useful for him. That's what we're going to see play out in the life of Moses today. And it's also the big idea that sits over top of our text. So if you're a note taker, go ahead and write this down. Before I can be useful to God, I must first be broken by him. All right, now sometimes that brokenness comes through a series of intentional decisions that you and I will make independently in response to the leading of the Spirit through His Word. In other words, we will choose to be broken. But in other cases, in fact, I would say in most cases, brokenness comes as the result of providential circumstance, right? Purposeful chastening that God brings into our lives against our will in order to break us and turn us toward His will for our lives. And that's why before, before we're going to see uh, Moses being this mighty, courageous man of God who's going to be used by God to deliver his people from Egypt, we have to first learn about a season of brokenness in Moses' life. 
The way that he was prepared to be an incredibly useful leader who brought glory to God with his life was by first being broken in the classroom of pain and hardship and failure. God had to completely deconstruct Moses before he could be used, before, before, uh, uh, before brokenness would, would, would lead him to usefulness. And it's not different for you and me, loved ones. But I have to tell you, there's actually a whole lot of hope in that. And that's what I want to share with you in the text today. I'm calling today's sermon, Brokenness Precedes Usefulness. And I invite you to follow along as I begin reading God's words to you here in verse 11 of Exodus 2. The word of the Lord says this, one day when Moses had grown up. All right, so pause there for a minute. That that means that a lot of time has obviously transpired between verse 10, we finished with last week, where Pharaoh's daughter took Jochebed's baby out of that little ark that he was floating in on top of the Nile River and named him Moses, right? So to be exact, actually, about 40 years has transpired between verses 10 and 11. You say, how do you know that? It doesn't say that. Well, because in Stephen's speech, In Acts chapter 7, verse 20, this is what Stephen says. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. And watch this. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, which is the episode in Moses' life that we're about to read about here in Uh, Exodus chapter 2. So Moses has enjoyed all of the highest privilege and wealth and education and comfort that would be at his disposal as a son of the royal family in Egypt. He's grown up as an Egyptian with all of those benefits, and now he's 40 years old. Now he's going to live to be about 120 years old. So to put that sort of in context, he's lived about a third of his life. I don't know if you know that the average lifespan of an American male living in the year 2024 is 79 years. And a third of that would be 26 years. So Moses is the equivalent of a 20-something-year-old millennial here, okay? And apparently, at some point in his adult journey, he has become very burdened over the treatment of the people of Israel. It's clear that he did understand that they were his people. He knew that he was not, by birth, an Egyptian, but he was a son of the Hebrews. And, And that's really important to realize, because if you read verse 11 too casually, it almost sounds as though Moses sort of accidentally discovered that Israel was out there suffering. But I don't think that's the case at all. Look at it again. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. So remember, Moses is the human author that God's writing, uh, using to write this down for us uh, as he leans into the Spirit. And so he says twice here of his own experience in the same sentence that these are his people. See that? Moses knew that. So at some point, he's, he started to identify himself not as an Egyptian, but as a Hebrew Israelite. And further, the word being translated as went out there is a really important word. Uh, it, says, it says that when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people. So that's the same word that throughout the entire Old Testament always means exodus. And that term would not have been lost on the original readers of this text. They, they would have been very, very familiar with this Hebrew word for exodus. So, so get this, before Moses could ever lead these people out in the great exodus, guess what? He's going to have to first have his own personal exodus. The, the one who will lead the exodus is going to make an exodus. And you know what? I don't think that's too different from a lot of our stories, is it? That before we're ever ready to help lead others out of their struggles and out of their difficulties, we have to have our own experience of being let out of our own seasons of difficulty. That was certainly the case with Moses. And notice what it says there in the middle of verse 11, that he looked on their burdens. The word looked has extreme emotional overturns. So, overturns. so the idea is that Moses started to share in the emotional distress that was being caused by the suffering God's people were experiencing. His heart was being shaped and aligned with the Hebrew people, and he was grieving over their situation, and he had this growing desire to help them. So do you see why I would say that Moses didn't just happen upon this oppression, like like it was one single example of Israelite abuse in his day? No, this has been growing and developing in his heart over a long period of time. It's, It's rooted in his very identity as a Hebrew himself, and he has this growing emotional concern for their well-being. And if there's any question about that remaining, Hebrews 11 makes it even more clear by giving us even a little bit more detail as to what was going on in the heart of Moses at this time. 
I mean, it's actually just so interesting to me that, that thousands of years later, in the New Testament, the Spirit is giving us more detail about this story than what, than what we actually learned from the guy who was there when it happened. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? That's awesome how God works through his word. Like Stephen's speech in Acts 7 that I showed you a moment ago, but also here, Hebrews eleven twenty four. 24, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. So the writer of Hebrews sets up this paradox between the fleeting pleasures of sin contrasted with a conscious choice that Moses made to identify with the mistreated people of God and as a result to simultaneously distance himself from the household of Pharaoh. In fact, verse 26 of that passage goes on to say, he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt for he was looking to the reward. Okay? Notice, notice that Moses' choice to choose Israel over Egypt is literally linked with bearing reproach for Christ. You say, how can that be? Jesus the Christ wouldn't be born for like hundreds of years, right? Well, Hebrews is actually making it clear that actually the whole Bible is about the person and work of Jesus Christ. And in effect, he's saying that when Moses chose to identify with the Hebrews, he was choosing to side with Jesus. He chose the reproach of Christ instead of the treasures of Egypt. He chose to side with God's people and give up the comforts of this earth as the greater reward and the greater pursuit of his life. So when Exodus 2.11 says that he went out to his people and he looked on their burdens, this was not some kind of isolated random incident. His burden for them had been growing for some time, as well as his burning desire to side with them and to free them. And look at what happens while he's out on this little survey through Egypt, the second half of verse 11, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. Therefore, verse 12, he looks this way and he looks that way. You know what that means, right? There's some guilt behind that. Now, he realized that if he stepped in to try and help this Hebrew relative, it, it might just get pretty dangerous for him because he's a member of the royal household. And the Hebrews are the slaves of the Egyptians. And the whole reason they became slaves in the first place was because of Pharaoh's fear that they might somehow revolt against him, remember? So if a member of the royal family starts act, acting like a vigilante, like superhero guy, and starts coming to the aid and the rescue of some of the slaves, how do you think that's going to go over with Pharaoh? He's going to see that as some sort of an insurrection or a coup that's developing under, under his watch, Right? So Moses, knowing that, looks this way, he looks that way to make sure nobody's around to witness what he's about to do. And then verse 12, seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Moses killed the Egyptian, the taskmaster, who had been beating this Hebrew slave. And then to cover his tracks, he buries him in the sand. All right? Now, no doubt, if you were to like, interview Moses in the moment, he probably would say that his act of violence and this act of murder you know, uh, was motivated by how badly this poor Hebrew guy was being uh, treated. And so he would have said something like, the end justifies the means, right? It's classic pragmatism. And then verse 13 says that the next day, he, he goes out to play vigilante superhero again. Look, when he went out the next day. So it, it appears that there must have been some kind of pattern for Moses to go out and cruise around Egypt and, and to look for opportunities to come to the aid of the suffering of his people. He's, just, he's looking for ways to help. But this time, as he's checking things out, look what he says. Look what he finds. Behold, two Hebrews are struggling together, all right? They're throwing punches. They're starting to fight. And Moses sees this, so he, he stops his chariot, and he jumps out, and he runs over to them. And look, he says to the man in the wrong, the guy who started the fight, evidently, why do you strike your companion? Like, come on, guys, you're brothers, right? You're, you're companions. You're, you're mistreated enough by your slave masters. Like, why in the world would you now mistreat each other? But the guy that Moses scolds doesn't really see his rebuke as kind compassion in the way that Moses probably intended it. And so he resorts to sort of like grade school level trash talking here. He's like, oh yeah, well, who made you the boss of me, right? Who put you in charge? Verse 14, he answers, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Who do you think you are? And, and then just to push back and kind of drive the knife with even a little more force in that, in that pushback. Look, do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Can you just imagine Moses' face at that moment? I'm sure he's like, shh, don't say that so loud. Like, like, what are you talking about? Where did you hear such a thing? Because remember, he, he thought he had covered his tracks pretty well, right? 
He thought that no one saw him do this and that he had covered it up pretty well, but clearly word has gotten out. And that could be disastrous for him if Pharaoh found out about it, which is why the text says then, Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. Well, obviously the thing is known, right? What thing? The, the Moses murdered an Egyptian in cold blood thing in order to protect one of Egypt's slaves. That thing. Listen to Stephen again over in Acts 7. He, Moses, supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. So here's Moses with this admirable, growing burden to do something about the oppression and the suffering that God's people were experiencing, but his presumption to take matters into his own hands and to literally kill another human being, it's turning out to actually pit him against the very people that he was trying to help, trying to relieve. Maybe you're wondering why. Like, why would, why would the Hebrew guy, like, give Moses such a hard time about this? Like, wouldn't he see this as something he should be glad about, that Moses has come to the aid and the defense of one of his relatives? Uh, Doug Stewart, in his commentary on this text, he gives a little helpful insight into what I think was probably going on in the culture at that time. He writes this, quote, It is not difficult to imagine why Moses was disliked or why the news about his murderous act had spread so far and so fast. An Egyptian overseer was missing. An investigation probably was underway already or soon would be. And there was every likelihood that the Hebrews would be blamed and severely punished for the overseer's murder. Because that's what oppressive governments do, right? When slaves kill their masters, all the other slaves get punished for it. That's what happens. Stuart goes on to say this, quote, such a situation would become the talk of the community and would easily surface someone's admission. I saw who did it. Like, I know what's going on here. What Moses had tried to do had, from his people's point of view, backfired. He had taken matters into his own hands, and his arrogance in doing so probably was going to get a whole lot of people in trouble. I agree. And that kind of fear of retaliation would have quickly become the talk of the town, don't you think? So in many respects, the Hebrew slave is actually right in asking, who in the world do you think you are to set us up like this? And I think we see in this moment that Moses' leadership is actually a lot like a whole lot of us aspiring young zealous leaders in our youth who jump right out of seminary, for example, and you know we're ready to take on the gates of hell with a water gun, full of zeal, like full of passion, but entitled and stubborn and presumptuous pure motives to do big things for God, but going about it in all the wrong ways, and as a result, offending the very people that we're trying to serve in the process. This, this is literally millennial Moses here. This is like Gen Z Moses. Big plans, big aspirations, big heart to help and to serve, extremely motivated to do great things for God, but not slow enough, not patient enough, not wise enough to make the right decisions in the right way at the right moment and also arrogant and proud enough to think that the work can get done in your own strength and in your own way instead of humbly and dependently waiting on God to lead and to direct in all of that you're like wait are we talking about Moses are we talking about us yes (laughs) because isn't it comforting to know in light of all the foolish stuff that you and I have done in our past and probably even in our recent past our own examples of immaturity and arrogance. Isn't it great to know that even you know, God's most elite servants have struggled with the exact same kind of self-centered pride and self-dependence that got them into trouble too? Isn't that a comfort? I mean, Moses totally blew it here. Even though he had a really good heart, he was arrogant and immature and he, he tried to serve God in his own strength and in his own way. And it was the wrong way, the completely wrong way. His motives were commendable, but his actions were not. But here's the thing, don't think for a moment that failures like this catch God off guard. Don't think that immature failures on the part of his servants derail his plan to use them as useful vessels later in his service. Oh no, God isn't done with this zealous but arrogant murderer yet. Watch what happens, verse 15. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. Not surprised, right? But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. Now, I have to believe that was a pretty dark day in Moses' life, don't you think? That little run for his life from Egypt. I mean, from his perspective, you have to understand, it it probably seemed like all of his hopes, 
all of his dreams, all of his, you know, the good things he wanted to accomplish on both sides of his life, it had all come to an end. Life as he knew it was over. He lost everything in Egypt and he lost his ability to help the Hebrews because they end up, you know, hating him in the process as well. I mean, he literally lost everything. He lost his home. He lost his family. He lost his prestige. His whole life was literally turned upside down in a moment and now he's a fugitive on the run. And where did he run to? Well, the text just told us that he escaped to the land of Midian, all right? Now, the Midianites were actually distant relatives of the Israelites. They're, they're descendants of the patriarch Abraham through his second wife, Keturah, according to Genesis chapter 25. And, it, and it's interesting to note that it was probably the Midianites, actually, also called the Ishmaelites, who originally were, were the ones that brought Joseph to Egypt in the first place when they purchased him from his angry brothers in Genesis chapter 37. So the Hebrews wouldn't even be in Egypt if it weren't for the Midianites. And throughout Israel's history, they're going to they're gonna play a significant role. Sometimes, I mean, it's going to be a very up and down relationship. Sometimes they're going to get along, sometimes not at all. Think like if you're familiar with the story of Gideon when Gideon fought against a huge Midianite army. You know that story? But evidently during this season, there was a a level of peace and friendship between the Israelites and the Midianites, which is why Moses would choose to flee to that region for solace and safety. All right, now the Midianites were nomadic desert people. So they're living out there in the desert, away from civilization, in the sand. And that's going to be very significant in the life of Moses, because think about it. Like years later, little does he know right now, but the skills that he's going to learn while he's out there in Midian surviving in the desert, those are going to be incredibly important skills to have later when he's the one called to lead millions of people across that desert and, and the one responsible to keep them all alive. You know, where and when did he learn to live in the desert like that? Well, it was right here in this dark season of his life in Midian when it felt like everything in his life had been flipped upside down and, and he had literally lost everything. Don't miss that. God was still working. There was, a, there was a point in all of this. He was using this season of brokenness as a training ground for future service and leadership. And Moses had no idea that that was what was going to happen. It was all part of the breaking that had to happen in his life to make him useful. And I, I don't know about you, but I have to tell you, I can totally relate with this experience that Moses is going through. It was about 13 years ago when God also orchestrated a a series of painful circumstances in my life that he ultimately used to like strip me down to nothing and break me of dependence on myself. I lost my job and and many of my friends. I lost my health. I lost my house in that season. Kim miscarried a baby. We we lost a baby. I lost the ministry position that I held in in a local church. I lost many of my ministry connections in my professional network all within just a few months. And in a period of just one of those months, I went from one day serving happily in God's church, leading worship and preaching to lots of people with a beautiful plush office overlooking a balcony with lots of respect and influence to sitting in a tiny little office cubicle in a building where I knew no one, doing a job that seemed pointless and meaningless and wondering what in the world has happened to my life. In fact, truth be told, the company I was working for at the time, they didn't even have enough room around the cubicle stations. So they stuck me in a closet with a folding table. And they're like, will this work out for you? Sure, right? What am I going to say? And one of the initial jobs they had me do was uh, they wanted me to arrive an hour earlier than all the other employees who work there because evidently they're way too busy to shred their own paper, right? All the important people, they they don't have time to shred paper. So they would stack up, and I'm not exaggerating, it was like a stack of paper like this high waiting for me every morning before the employees would arrive. And I would sit in my little office in the closet with my shredder that could only shred five pieces of paper at a time. And this was my life. (laughs) Five pages at a time. I'm telling you, I had a lot of hard conversations with the Lord in that closet. It's hard for me to talk about it, honestly, because I can still feel the emotion welling up. Sitting there thinking, what has happened in my life? I used to be really important, God. I've been to seminary, for goodness sake. I've traveled the country preaching and doing concerts in over 100 churches. I dedicated my whole life to serving you, to serving your church, God. Why? So I can sit in this closet and shred paper? I have to tell you, that job ended up being a huge blessing in the days to come. You know, 
God did a lot of things and prospered, prospered my time there in many ways. He reshaped my, my life in amazing ways. I became very close with my boss and many of the other employees. Like, God is good to give me that job. But I'm telling you, initially, those were very dark days in Midian for me. And most of those mornings, nobody else was in the office, and so I would just talk to God out loud. Like, if you'd walk by, you'd think there was something crazy going on in that room. And I have to tell you as well, it, it seemed to me like he wasn't listening. I was talking, and he wasn't listening. And those were days of wrestling with him over who was going to be the boss of my life. But here's what I would tell you today. As hard as that season was, it was necessary for John Tracy's development. Because it was the training ground that God used to strip me of my pride and my dependence on myself. And I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that I fully learned those lessons. But that was a season that dramatically ripped me out of a legalistic religious system that did not honor him. And he set me on a path, a different path, that would ultimately bring me here to lead God's people at Keystone in a different season and in a different way. Like never in a million years would I have ever thought that I would be the one standing here preaching God's word to you today as your pastor. I, if you would have said that to me when I was sitting in that closet, I would have said this. I don't even want to work for a church again, ever. Don't talk to me about working in a church, much less leading a church. If God had not done something radical in my life to turn my world upside down, to send me out into my own two years of wilderness wandering, and to reconstruct me into a different person, I would have never been used in the ways that God had planned. I had to be broken. And I was. And that's the exact same kind of thing that's happening in Moses' life here. And notice verse 15 says that when he first arrived in Midian, God providentially brought him to a well, and he sat down by it to rest. See that? I mean, that's pretty obvious. If there's a well out in a dry, hot desert, then that's probably going to be a place where people gather and sit down and relax, right? Especially if you're a, a shepherd and you've got a whole bunch of sheep that you've got to keep alive. You're going to bring them to the area where the water is to hydrate them, which, which is the context for what we read in verse 16. Now, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. So can you see them there? Seven girls who come strolling down to the well. Why do he send his daughters? I, I would love to ask him that. He didn't have any servants or anybody else who can go get the water for daddy's sheep back home. Evidently, there's a bunch of good old boy shepherds sitting here, and they, they, they start to pick on these girls. They start to harass them and give them a hard time. And look at verse 17. The shepherds came and drove them away, but never fear. Da, 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 Captain Moses that stands up. He sweeps in like a superhero, like a vigilante, like he's been accustomed to doing, and he saves them, it says, and watered their flock. I mean, I don't know if he went Jason Statham on them or what. I don't know what happened here exactly. But it, evidently, whatever this, season, uh, this, this scene looked like, these seven chicks were pretty impressed because verse 18, when they came home to their father, Raul, they're still talking about it. He said, how is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. So whatever happened here, when Moses threw down on these raucous shepherds, he was the talk of the whole house when he got home. All these daughters, you know, they, they, they could not stop singing his praise. But here's the thing. I don't want you to miss this. This tells us much more about Moses than just that he had evidently some sweet fighting skills or that he was like really brave. Like that's not the point. The point is, I think what this demonstrates is that even after all of the pain and the rejection that Moses had been through, here he is still with this God-given concern to help alleviate the suffering of other people. People who are being uh, uh, you know, mistreated. He has not lost that. He, he still has a really big heart to help and rescue people in distress, which means that he must not have succumbed to the kind of depressed thinking that you and I do sometimes. Where after trying to help somebody else or, or to serve in some particular way and, and it doesn't go well, we get all depressed about that and we want to quit. You know, maybe you've tried to counsel somebody or help somebody in your life and they end up taking advantage of you. They end up taking your service for granted or mis misinterpreting your motives and your intentions. And in fact, the next thing you know, they're over there talking behind your back. They're, they're throwing you under the bus after all that you've done for them. And you get really burned and hurt in that process. Let me ask you, how, how, how do people typically respond in a situation like that? Well, here's what I hear all the time. Well, I'm never doing that again, right? 
Yeah, I learned that lesson the hard way. Fine, see if I care. Clearly, I'm not appreciated here, so all right, I don't need this hassle anymore. I'm never going down that road again. Listen to me. If you, if you get involved in people's lives, you, you commit yourself to serving the Lord and, and try to like, meet people's need, and you never want to get hurt in that process, then I would just tell you, right, don't, don't do anything. It's not going to work. Because the truth is, hurt people hurt people. That's what happens. So when you're, you're the one trying to help hurt people, don't be surprised when you get hurt in the process too. Moses didn't succumb to a self-focused quitter mentality. He just kept serving and trying to help even when he was hurting himself, even when he had personally failed, even in exile. He's not turning his back on what he knew was right. So I wonder if that could be said of you, friend. Is there room in your understanding of who God is and his purposes for the difficult circumstances that he's allowing in your life for you to still be engaged in serving his mission, even though you've been hurt, even though you've been burned, even though, frankly, you're not 100% whole yet yourself yet? Can you keep pouring your life out for other people, or have you succumbed to the idea that you have to wait until you get everything uh, you know, fixed in your life perfectly before you're ever going to be willing to, to get out there and serve others again? See, it seems as though, even though life had been devastatingly disappointing for Moses, he was still motivated by Christ-like compassion to serve other people and to come to the aid of others who were in need. And from there, the story progresses fairly quickly. Verse 18 again, when they came home to their father, Raul says, how is it that you have come home or, or, or so soon today? They said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. And like any good dad with daughters, he's like, wow, that sounds like a pretty great guy. Where is he? <laughs> Maybe I need to meet this eligible bachelor and introduce him to one of you daughters. Look what he says, verse 20. He, he says to the daughters, then where is he? And why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. Like, bring him over. So they do. They call him. They have a meal together. Moses gets to meet the father while the girls sat around and cooed and called over him. By the way, this, this man called Raul here, also goes by the name of Jethro elsewhere in the Bible. Jethro, Raul, same guy, depending on the passage. You know, in the Bible, when they refer to people, um, you know, sometimes it depends on the author of the text, but more likely, sometimes the first name's used, or the last name, or even the title of the name. So, again, same guy, Raul, Jethro, and Evidently, one of the daughters of Raul's seven ends up being the pick of the litter for Moses. Verse 21, Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter, Zipporah. So Zipporah get hitched, uh, gets hitched to Moses. They're married. Then we're going to fast forward again. It's like time leaps forward. Verse 22, we read the happy news that Zipporah gives birth to a son. Praise the Lord, right? And Moses calls his name Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. Now, that name Gershom is a very significant name. It means, as Moses says, sojourner. And Moses named him that because it represents this whole season of his life. He says, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. So doesn't, doesn't that give us some real perspective as to what was going on in his heart and his mind after all of these years? Even the joys of finding a wife and having their first son there in Midian, those things have not erased the feelings that he has of being an exile and an outcast, a nomad and a wanderer, losing everything that he had experienced in Egypt. It had, it had so impacted him that he even names his first son to reflect how difficult it had been. And that's how the passage ends today, a little dark and heavy, right? Not really the happy ending we were hoping for. A broken Moses and Midian, these were hard days for him. He had, a, he had a big heart to alleviate the suffering of God's people, but his attempts to help had blown up in his face, and now he's living in exile, and he's going to live there for another 40 long years before God's going to ever bring him back out of the land of Midian and take him back to rescue the people in Egypt. I ask you again, have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a season where you just feel like the bottom has fallen out? Like everything you were chasing in life has come to a crashing halt? You just keep experiencing loss after loss, and you essentially look at your life like Moses, and you're thinking, it's over. All my best days are behind me now. I'll never be happy again. I've lost too much. I've, I've lost my marriage. I've lost my job. I've, I've lost that relative to death. My, my life's just never going to be the same. 
I'm here to tell you, a season in Midian is a game changer. It leaves you thinking, how in the world does Midian fit into God's plan? Like, where did it all go so wrong? That's where Moses is at. But lest you think that all hope is lost, we're going to soon learn that actually this was a very significant part of God's ultimate plan for his life. And it's an incredible example and reminder of how God uses brokenness as a tool to rebuild and to reconstruct his people for their best service in the days ahead. Because listen again, very carefully, brokenness precedes usefulness. It does. Before God can ever use someone greatly, he often hurts them deeply. Before I can be useful to God, I must first be broken by him. Moses will become an amazing leader for God's people. He will be remembered uh, uh, by the pages of the Bible as a man full of faith. He's literally going to be called the meekest man to ever live. And he's going to see some of the most unbelievable displays of God's power that any human eye has ever witnessed firsthand. But do you want to know where that great man who would serve so boldly in the future was formed and shaped It was in decades of brokenness and loss while no doubt thinking in the moment, there's no point to any of this. There's nothing left for me in life. God must be done using me. Oh, no, friend, don't lose heart. That is never the case with God. So what can we pull out of this text by way of application to help us during our seasons in Midian? Well, I think there are are three really powerful lessons here. So let me just give them to you quickly. The first one is this. I need to be broken because, number one, self-sufficiency is incompatible with my service to the Lord. Do you hear me? A lack of humility and an arrogant spirit of self-dependence, like like believing in yourself and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and muscling your way through the hard times, those things might work out in the corporate world, uh, you know, in the workplace and other parts of culture. But listen very carefully. They never work when it comes to usefulness for the mission of Christ. They never work because self-sufficiency is incompatible with spiritual leadership and spiritual service. You cannot be a godly husband or a godly wife or a godly mother or father or a godly single adult or teenager unless you get this into your brain that every single thing going on in your life is not about you. It's about God. It's about God's plans for you, which means that self-sufficiency is actually the very essence of the problem that Christianity seeks to address. Think about the gospel message itself, that that God is holy and we are not. We're we're sinners who have been alienated from our maker because of our sin. And the Bible presents the solution to that problem as God sending a sinless person, his own son, Jesus Christ, to bear the weight of our sin penalty for us and to rise from the dead with a power foreign to us so that we can be forgiven and so that he can justly deal with the problem of sin. In other words, we can't make ourselves sinless, can we? We can't undo all that we've done. We we can't pay off the debt of sin that we've acquired. And we certainly can't raise ourselves from the dead. There's nothing we can do to improve our hopeless situation by ourselves. We are helpless in this. We are completely incapable of solving the problem of sin on our own. So we need to be rescued, right? So in the same way... You know, we're just like the ancient Israelites in Egypt. We need a deliverer to come and rescue us from our hopeless condition. And the Christian faith at its core is exactly that. That Jesus, the sinless son of God, came into the world to save sinners who cannot save themselves. But here's the thing. It's not not that he just came like, like one time and then we're good to go, right? No, we are in constant need of rescue. Every single day of our lives. In the same way that these people in Israel are going to continue to need to depend on their rescuer, Moses. Even after they're freed from Egypt initially, if they're going to survive out there in the desert as sojourners, we also need the constant help of our deliverer, Jesus Christ. Even after our initial rescue from sin at our point of conversion. In other words, it's not just that we needed God to rescue us from hell, but then we can turn around and look at it and be like, thanks God, but I'll take it from here. No, no, no. Just like self-sufficiency is completely incompatible with conversion, it's also completely incompatible with Christian living. To be a Christian is to embrace a posture of humble dependence on the rescuer. And to live a Christian life is to continue in that same humble dependence on the rescuer. Amen? Jesus modeled this for us perfectly in his life on earth. 
Look at Philippians 2.5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God himself, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, the whole model of spiritual leadership and service for God is completely opposite of what the world would tell us. It's the upside down path toward being useful in God's kingdom work. It comes through humble dependence upon the God who made us and saved us rather than trusting and depending on ourselves. That's the only way to experience lasting fulfillment and purpose in being useful for him. George MacDonald once said, in whatever man does without God, he must fail miserably or succeed miserably. Boom, that's it, right? Worldly success. That's not going to feel any better than worldly failure if it's accomplished through self-sufficiency. We have to constantly preach this aspect of the gospel to ourselves all the time, especially as we begin to see the evidence of God using us in various ways. It just runs totally contrary to our self-centered tendencies, which is why Paul asks in 1 Corinthians 4, what do you have that you haven't received? The obvious answer is nothing, right? Right? Romans 3.27, then what becomes of our boasting? Answer, it is excluded, says Paul. Why? Because everything we have is a gift from God and not the result of anything that we have done. And until you and I can fully embrace that with our whole being, we have not yet been fully broken, friends. And since brokenness is a prerequisite for usefulness in God's kingdom service, we should then expect more breaking lessons to come, should we not? Until we fully give up dependency on ourselves, only then will we be useful in the ways that God is shaping us to be. I need to be broken because self-sufficiency is incompatible with my service for the Lord. And secondly, we learn from Moses here that I need to be broken because my good motives do not justify my bad decisions. Now, I think that's super clear in this text, that, that, that Moses had a commendable righteous zeal And it was motivating him to do something big about the oppression that he saw taking place all around him. His motives were pure. He had the right heart attitude in what he was doing. But don't miss the fact that even though he had the right heart attitude and the right motives, he still went down the wrong path. And as a result, he lost a lot on both sides of this equation. He offended the people he was trying to serve and he was no longer welcome with the people he'd grown up with. And I've just seen this happen so many times. Somebody gets a really big heart for some aspect of ministry and they get really, really passionate about it and they, they've got all the right motives and they've got tons of zeal to get it done. It's not what they want to do that is the problem. It's the way in which they go about it. And again, this isn't exclusively a problem in our youth, but, but it is a common problem in our youth, is it not? Zealous, passionate, eager to do great things for God, but entitled and inexperienced and stubborn and inflexible and impatient, not willing to humbly you know, wait on the right timing, not willing to ask questions and learn from other people. It's spiritual immaturity, and it's a big problem because it gets in the way of usefulness for God. The point, the, the point is that just because you have the right motives does not mean that you're ready to make the right decisions. And so the caution is to be sure that as we get really excited about opportunities to serve others and to serve the Lord, that we do not assume that we're necessarily seeing things clearly, right? We we, we need to depend on God to be the one who's working in and through all of those plans. In almost 25 years of local church ministry, I've just seen so many deacons and pastors and teachers and other Christian leaders come and go who at one time had really big ideas to lead and serve in God's church, but who today aren't leading at all. And why is that? Well, again, it wasn't typically their ideas and their dreams and their passions that were the problem. Their motives were pure. They really did want to make a difference. They wanted to serve. They wanted to be used, but they were spiritually immature. And as a result, they could not humbly and dependently serve without insisting on their own way all the time, insisting on their timing. That's, that's exactly what we see in Moses. And it's a caution to all of us who are striving to serve the Lord, to not assume that your way is the only way or that you can do no wrong or that you see things more clearly than everybody else sees them. See, our sinful tendency is just to be overconfident and to trust ourselves and our own vantage point way too much. 
And as I said already, this is not exclusively a problem in our youth. In fact, frankly, sometimes it's as we age and as we gain more experience in life that we're even more tempted to assume that we have all the answers and that we know the right way to do everything. And so we become increasingly more inflexible and our our motives to serve are overridden by our inability to humbly work with other people in our lives. It's a huge problem, guys, and it should be the opposite, that the older we get, we trust ourselves and our judgment less, frankly, not more. There there should be this growing sense that, that I don't trust my own ability to make wise decisions independently. I need God's spirit to direct my heart. I need God's word to illuminate my mind. I need God's people to speak into my life because I'm always just one decision away from making the wrong one and hurting myself and hurting the name of Christ and destroying my life in the process. God's church needs humble, willing servants whose motives to serve him are paired with Christ-like deference and love. People who are patient and kind, not motivated by envy or proud boasting, not arrogant or rude, not insisting on your own way, not uh, irritable or resentful, like, like, well, if I can't do it my way, then I'm not going to serve at all, right? No, 1 Corinthians 13, 7, a willingness to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things, endure all things for the sake of Christ and the advancement of his mission. It's about him. It's not about us. The way to greatness in his kingdom is through brokenness, friends. The way up is down. The way to greater service is greater humility. The way to lead is to serve. It's the upside down path to usefulness for the Lord. And any other path is going to fail regardless of how pure the motives may be. And lastly, I find, and I find this to be incredibly comforting, I need to be broken because, number three, the best spiritual lessons will come from my worst personal moments. Have you found that to be true in your life? That God has used the classroom of hard providence and difficult circumstance as a training ground of pain and failure so that you could learn some of the best and most important spiritual lessons in your life that you can't learn any other way. I'm telling you, if you have not learned this yet, you will. It's coming. Some of you are in the middle of it right now. Like, like, this is how you describe your life. Deep pain, deep hardship. You're wrestling through some very, very hard things. And in the middle of it, you're wondering, how in the world is this ever going to accomplish anything good in my life? Hear me, it will. And someday you'll see it, even though you can't see it right now. All of your pain and all of your difficult circumstance, these are are all parts of the training ground that God is using to break you down, to mold you, to shape you into the usable vessel that he intends for you to be for maximum usefulness in his service. So even your failures, even your sin is being used by God. It will be used by God in another season. None of it's going to be wasted by him. He he was forming things in Moses' heart all along, preparing him to be the great leader and the great servant that he would become. And he's doing the exact same thing in your heart and mine as well. But we'll go further and faster in the sanctification plan if we'll just simply humbly accept what he's allowing and learn to dependently trust him and trust his timing to use all of this in the way that he has ordained. Because as long as we're still insisting on our way to do his work, we're not ready yet, right? We're not fully broken. We've not been completely humbled yet. Listen to what the great apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Look at these last few words here. Of whom I am the foremost. Is that how you would describe the great apostle Paul? Like, I'd probably say something more like the greatest Christian to ever live, right? But by his own testimony, even as an older man, Paul never lost sight of the fact that he was still nothing more than a sinner saved by grace. A former persecutor of the church who is now being used by God to serve that same church. In spite of all the amazing ways that God had used him to build the community of faith, he never arrived at a place of spiritual superiority or pride. He just saw himself as the foremost sinner in the room. Is that how you would describe yourself today, as the the, the worst sinner in the room today? The, The one in most need of God's grace? The one most shocked that God would ever choose to use you? See, that's the kind of attitude that leads to greatness and usefulness when our high opinion about our own opinions is stripped down to nothing and we're left with nothing but humble amazement that God would choose to use us at all. It's all part of the wonderful tapestry that he's weaving together 
to make you and me useful for him. And I can't always explain how it's going to fit together, but I do know this, friends. The one thing that God is definitely doing with all of our trials is that he's kicking over all of our little crutches and all of our little, our little props that we've set up in our lives that make us think that we can depend on ourselves instead of him. And he wants to use some of those worst moments in your life to produce some of the greatest lessons that you could ever learn as he shapes you into an entirely different person by his grace. That's the plan, loved ones. That's the path to usefulness and greatness for God. Brokenness precedes usefulness. It is hard, but it is so necessary. Tozer was right. God doesn't use a person greatly until he hurts him deeply. So we must be broken. Before I can be useful to God, I must be broken by him. Let's pray. God, thank you for all that you've shown us here today. This passage is just brimming with opportunity for us to see the character of who you are and your, your goals and purposes for our lives. And simultaneously, it shows us so much about ourselves, God, the way in which we are so prone to rely on our own strength and our own abilities to press forward with what we would say are good motives and good dreams and good desires, and yet to totally leave you out of the equation. And as a result, to experience loss and hardship and pain. Ways that you break us down and tear us apart in order to build us back up. Lord, from our human perspective, we would certainly ask that you would spare us of pain. And yet we have to stand back today and acknowledge that these are the ways that you shape us. There are things that we're learning in our seasons of adversity that we cannot learn any other way. And so for the one here today who is suffering, would you fix their eyes on this hope-filled reality that this is making them into the person that you want them to be? It is precisely the pain that testifies of your care and love for them. You love them too much to keep them in this place of stubborn pride. And so you set up a personal training program for them to be stripped and broken so that they can be useful. And God, that's what all of life is about. It's why we're here. To give praise to your name and to be used on mission for your eternal kingdom. We're not here for ourselves. Remind us of this afresh and send us back out today with our, our hearts and, our, and our, our eyes, our focus fixed solely on the purpose for which you made us. Give us grace to speak truth and life into others this week. Help us live upright lives in accordance with your word. Help us testify of the, the great things that you're doing, even in the, in, the, in the circumstances of painful providence. Lord, we'll give you praise for all of it, and we need your help because we admit how prone we are to wander. We're going to need this on Tuesday morning. We're going to need it on Thursday morning. We're going to need it in the cubicle, in the closet, in whatever circumstance you would lead us into, would you remind us constantly that you're with us, you're for us, and you're building us into somebody that can be used by you. We love you, God, and we give all this back to you in praise, in Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and let's sing in closing?